next pad we lived in New York City, and she was bringing, she, she had to be Scotty at the front of the to the Red Cross and the hospital. It was adorable. Yeah. carefully with all the microphones. We're going to put it right on. We're going to be right in front of you guys. Right there. That's loud. probably good. That's taped down. Yeah. Good afternoon. Thank you for being here. Uh, we appreciate you taking the time uh, to listen to the proposal that has been drafted by Representatives Nigren and Falskowski. So I think it's fair to say that for Republicans all across the state, and especially inside the Capitol, education has always been our top priority. It's why in this budget we continue to support record levels of investment for K-12 education. It's why we actually have continued to increase funding for the UW system and our tech colleges. It's why many of us here have long supported ideas like school choice to be able to have the most comprehensive, best school system for K through 12 education in the entire country. I think we deserve a lot of credit um, as Republicans for the reforms that we have done to make sure school districts are able to continue to provide the best education in the country and do it in a way that continues to drive reforms for um, the positive aspects of improving education. What we have here today is a simple plan where every single school district in the state benefits from current law. That's important for us to remember. Number two, it actually delivers more money to the classroom than Governor Walker's proposal or proposals that we have heard from our friends in the state Senate. It continues to reduce property taxes with a goal to say that for every single median home in the entire state, you would continue to see reductions in property taxes. So for the average median home, under our proposal, property taxes will be lower next year than they are today. So we continue to meet the commitment that we have to deliver on our property tax relief proposals. We also continue to fund the Assembly Republicans Forward Agenda. If you remember a year ago when we proposed ideas in education reform, one of those is to make sure that we have technology inside the classroom. So this proposal pro fulfills the promise that Assembly Republican uh, members made to the voters last year to have a, an opportunity for school districts to participate in guaranteeing that every freshman in high school has access, has, has access to a technology device so that they are able to compete in the long run. It also takes one of the main fundamental sticking points and we think uh, begins to address it in the long run. As Republicans, we have always believed in the idea of local control. It's why we have said we want, if voters need to spend more money inside uh, the classroom or in local governments, we believe they should go to referenda. Under the proposal that Governor Walker has laid out, basically when a local district or a local municipality decides to increase their levy because perhaps there's new construction, perhaps they've been frugal in the past and need to make an investment, or because um, they had a local referenda, the state of Wisconsin through income and sales tax dollars is buying down that increase. So just this last, uh, last few days, I saw Paul Soglin laying out a goal that said that Madison's taxes are hopefully going to increase by about 2%. Under the formula that Governor Walker is working with, it's actually the rest of the state who will pay for that 2% increase in taxes in Madison, in taxes in Dane County, or taxes anywhere else. So our proposal simply says, 
If you want to continue to have a local referendum, you should be able to do that, but not have a guarantee that the entire state is going to pay for those referenda. That as a local community continues to increase with new construction and new building, that they would be able to continue to use those revenues to invest in their community as they grow. And that we do all of that with taking care of some of the long-term structural problems inside our school funding formula. And Representative Nigren is actually going to talk about that. Well, good afternoon. Um, the Assembly Caucus and the Republican majorities, as well as the governor, we prided ourselves over the last seven years as being the problem solvers. This proposal is addressing a significant challenge, and that is equity of school funding. So this plan, in addition to uh, significant categorical and per pupil increases, targets aids to frugal, low spending school districts. Levy limits, while useful, have left frugal school districts locked into low spending limits first established in 1993 that have not kept pace with the cost of education. Levy limits range from 9172 in Chilton and New Holstein to over 15000 at Nicolay Union High School. This plan begins to level that playing field. And just to re uh, reiterate how, how significant an issue this is, about 60% of K-12 students in this state attend a school in a school district that is spending below the state average. Over 200 school districts have a levy authority under 9,800. So this, as the uh, speaker had mentioned, this plan puts more money in the classroom when compared to the governor's uh, plan and current law. This uh, also will go, take a significant step forward in reducing the need for referendums. 55% of the schools that have been going to referendum are low spending districts. It has been said from the Senate that we should be addressing this significant problem, which they agree with, in an environment where we have increased revenues. There is no better time than when we have over $1 billion of additional revenues and $650 million of dollars committed to education to address this problem. This problem has been manifesting itself for over 24 years. The perspective that this is just a rural school issue this issue impacts Oak Creek, it impacts Green Bay, it impl impacts Rhinelander, districts both large and small, urban, rural, they, many of them throughout the state are impacted. However, I just want to say, while comprehensive, this plan is a starting point for negotiations with our friends in the Senate. It is hope, we are uh, hopeful that we can, uh, I would offer today at, at this time, an opportunity to sit down together with them early next week and negotiate a position that can benefit all students and all taxpayers throughout the state of Wisconsin. To uh, talk more specifically about the work she's done on, on rural uh, issues, I want to introduce uh, Representative Felskowski, who has worked a great deal the last two sessions on this significant issue. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Nigren. Um, one of the things that happened my, the first year I was elected four, two sessions ago is Representative Rob Swearingen and I approached Speaker Voss and the governor, and we asked if we could do a rural schools task force, which they said absolutely go ahead and do. And then last session, Speaker Voss authorized an urban school task force, which was headed up by Representative Rodriguez. And some of the things that came out of that was opportunity, opportunity for students no matter where you live and what locale you're in. Should a student in Elko, Wisconsin only have five math classes versus a student in Appleton having 47 math classes? How do we expect those students to compete at a higher education level or even right into the workforce if they are not given the opportunity to do so? So what we did is we looked at ways where school districts can become more efficient and can partner together. And we're doing that through um, whole grade sharing and incentivizing that, as well as shared services. Last session, we did the legislation and the statutory um, changes that were needed for whole grade sharing. And that comes off of a model that Iowa has used to great success. And this session, we are doing something to incentivize that even further through a categorical aid to, for um, whole grade sharing. Currently, that's funded through the funding formula, which leaves a lot of instability for the schools that want to move in that direction. 
Um, one of the other things that we're doing in this is we're doing some statutorily changes to uh, teacher licensure and other things that maybe that's not really related to funding but that came out of those urban and rural school task forces to really help our students accomplish because the end goal and I've heard this throughout our caucus I, we heard it throughout the state is opportunity for students to be able to compete and to be able to successful to be successful once they leave um, the K through 12 system thank you I'm Representative Jeremy Thiesfeld. I serve the 52nd District, which is primarily the city of Fond du Lac, and I also serve as chairman of the Assembly Education Committee. Uh, I once heard a wise man a few weeks ago say that uh, children may be 33% of our budget, but they're 100% of our future. And I, I think that this budget is taking that into account. Ever since I've been in the legislature, especially since I've been chairman of the Education Committee, I've heard from superintendents all across the state, particularly the rural superintendents, uh, because many of them are low spending, about how they're locked into a, a funding formula from 20 plus years ago. Uh, that is a huge issue. In my district, I represent somewhat of an urban school in Fond du Lac, and I also represent a rural district of Oakfield, which has 600 students in it. Both of these districts, an urban district and a rural district, will see great benefit from this plan. Uh, it's going to create less reliance on referendums, and it's going to give more certainty to schools all across the state. Uh, so I, I'd like to commend the, those who have put this plan together. It's a comprehensive plan that touches many areas of education, and I think it's a positive step for our state. And I'm anxious to see uh, what plan the Senate is going to be able to come up with. Uh, because we're anxious to work with them and be happy to stay around and answer any questions afterwards uh, who is sure. next? so just wrapping it up um, I do want to make sure that we thank Governor Walker for the um, great investment in public education that this budget provides uh, I listened to what he said yesterday where he said look there are certain priorities that he has but if he sees ideas that can improve where he wants to go uh, he is willing to work with us on that and negotiate. I think that's really what this entire process is. It's not about us versus them. It's not about which side you're on. It's about whose side are we going to work for, and that's really the taxpayers. And it's really the students of our state, and it's really trying to find the very best answer so we can keep Wisconsin moving in the right direction. So uh, I am optimistic that we have a really good plan, but as Representative Nygren said, it's a starting point. Uh, we also want to say, geez, if the Senate has other ideas that are good or the governor has things that he'd like to change to be able to help make this a proposal that we all can have buy-in into, uh, I think that's a really good part of the process, and it's how democracy is supposed to work, right? We listen to the public at the public hearings. They are making changes to what many of the superintendents said were their most pressing issues. We're not just going to say the hearings didn't matter and just stick with whatever the governor had. That's the whole point of listening to make sure that we reflect what the whole state needs and not just one idea that was put out there. So with that, we're happy to answer any questions. Uh, you said, John, you are happy to talk to the Senate next week. Does that mean no finance meetings this week or there's no change you guys? Well, I'm still hopeful for the, uh, later this week, yes. Right. And then you're talking about take care of taxpayers. Governor Walker said bottom line. Property tax bills have to be below 14 for to sign the budget. Your police says below 10, so you're off by quite a bit. So how is this going to mesh with his veto pledge? Well, first of all, our goal is to have property taxes lower than they are today. Uh, that would be a savings uh, over 2010 significantly beyond where we are. Um, we know, unfortunately, that when Governor Walker introduced his budget, it didn't even meet the 2014 pledge. So we would have to go back and find additional cuts um, to be able to even fulfill that pledge, which is why when we look at it as a public policy decision, I think that if the city of Madison decides they want to raise their property taxes by 2%, I don't know why it's incumbent upon people who live in Racine County or any other place around the state to help cover that cost. So the basic governing philosophy that we have is if you go to referenda, you have the ability to tax yourselves. That's what we believe in, right? So the idea of saying that taxpayers across the state are going to go to referenda and whatever the results, the state of Wisconsin through income and sales tax dollars will buy those out going forward, will mean that over time, there is basically no revenue for the other priorities that we also have. We have talked about it a lot. In our caucus, we wanna have a significant impact on income taxes. We wanna have a significant impact on business taxes so we can continue to grow and bring companies here. We have a lot of our members, myself included, who'd love to do something on the personal property tax. So I think there are a lot of priorities that our caucus has 
And if the only priority is really going to be focusing on in the future buying down referenda, it'll mean we can have no other conservative reforms that we really want to have happen to. So what's the end game here? If the governor says he's going to veto anything that allows property taxes to go higher than they were in 14, Senator Majority Leader Fitzgerald says he's rejecting this plan. What is the end game for the assembly? Well, first of all, I think it's unfortunate um, that at 12.25, five minutes before our press conference, uh, Senator Fitzgerald put out a statement before he even heard what our plan really was uh, or the comments about it, that he said immediately he's just going to be a rubber stamp for Governor Walker. I don't get why we would say we don't want to improve his plan. I think his plan is probably overwhelmingly good, but we as legislators, a co-equal branch of government, want to improve the plan. So remember last session, Governor Walker had school aid increases at zero. The legislature, through hard work and a big effort, was able to find ways to increase school funding. The governor came around and said that that is a good idea. So I know Governor Walker can be flexible when good ideas are put out there, and that's why I think it's important for us to go and talk about this plan, not just have it be negotiated in some backroom deal where nobody even knows what's in the plan, but I want the authors of the bill to go out Talk about this the whole week. Let's have a discussion about the public. Do we actually want to deal with low income or low revenue ceiling districts? Should they have the ability to have the same education in every part of the state, regardless of whether or not they have the ability to tax? That's, those are important discussions that we want to have. So you know, while it's possible finance could meet, I hope they would go around the state and talk about our plan, discuss it, see if there are ways that we can help to persuade our friends in the Senate and our ally in Governor Walker to be able to say parts of the plan we like, parts of the plan we reject, but don't just say out of whole cloth every idea in there is bad before he even sees what's in it. This Senator Fitzgerald's 1226. I'm sorry, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Does that show, though, just how far these talks have broken down at a stalemate? So I'm willing to negotiate at any time, any place, anywhere, as long as people of goodwill get together and don't draw hard lines in the sand before they even heard the other person's ideas. So I think it's been months where we have been saying to the Senate, show us your plan. What do you want to do on transportation? We put ours out there what seems like a month ago, uh, but it's a lot longer than that. We put out our ideas on education today. I think that'd be great if they said, hey, we love Governor Walker's plan, but we have some suggested changes too. And let's put those out for the public to vet. Let's hear what people have to say. So we prefer a process that's much more open and transparent, which allows us to have these discussions in public, might take a little longer. Doesn't mean we have some kind of an artificial timeline where we have to, you know, hurry and get to an answer in, you know, a day or two. Um, I think these are good ideas that deserve public vetting. So it's very, it'd be very easy to just rubber stamp the governor's proposal on education. It gives money to everybody, right? Every school district to bet, uh, gets more resources. But at the same time, the inequities that exist in the current funding format would still exist two years from now. This is a unique opportunity for us to address that problem and, and still be able to provide significant resources for all schools throughout the state, big, small, rural, urban, suburban. The, the plan looks like it will free up A little bit, it's a little bit less than that, yes. Okay, what would you like to see that? Um, well, I, so I think that the speaker commented earlier, there's some in our caucus that have, uh, uh, have expressed concerns about uh, pop possibly tax reform, uh, you know, doing more in tax reform, personal property tax. There are some that have had concerns about some of the initiatives on, uh, on auditors and the onus that it puts on, on business. Um, so those, those resources, while still putting more in the classroom, and I want to make that clear, the Fiscal Bureau has, has confirmed that this puts more planned, spendable resources into the classroom, reduces property taxes over where they are today uh, by $10. And um, it, it still gives us this, this significant improvement on a problem that's been existing since 1993. When you say it puts more resources into the classroom, can you define what that, that means? Well, more spendable dollars in the, in more spendable dollars, uh, in, the, in the classroom. So remember, under our school funding formula, you take in the school levy credit, which is really property tax relief, in addition to general aids, categorical aids, all of the money that is actually spent by the school district. So by putting less into the school levy credit, by not buying out those referendum results, 
it allows us to put more money inside the classroom so we actually see that money going to the kids to get the best education they can. So uh, if there's the media has specific questions on the, this is a very technical um, issue, school funding. Um, I don't want a media availability to divulge into, into that conversation uh, that probably will glaze most people's eyes over. Uh, I'm, I'm willing to sit down with my staff uh, and, and the media and, and run through the technical side of the proposal. Well, can you tell us, Governor's number 649, what is your number for the K-12 um, Do we know the top? I, it, it's not 100 million less. Uh, it's, I believe, in the five. We'll, we'll get to that number. So, so Senator Fitzgerald said that if you guys don't meet by the end of the week, they may have to start discussing doing their own budget. Do you guys have a point at which you say Clearly, the Senate's not going to work with us. We have to start our own budget. I'll defer to the speaker I mean, on that. But uh, that was so. The Senator Darling made that comment yesterday at an event I was with her speaking at. Uh, that was the first I'd heard of it. She always is very uh, interested in making sure that if there's some big decision being made, that uh, they're uh, aware of it. I was not aware of that comment. I'm still under the. Uh, uh, perspective that we can work out any different differences of a pop from a policy standpoint that we're at and uh, so I said lot next week how about tomorrow or this afternoon we can sit down with them I'm willing to do that, that as well right so the biggest thing is from my understanding of talking to the fiscal bureau since we've had this joint finance committee we've never had um, individual budgets when one party uh, controls everything so there is absolutely no reason to make threats I'm not gonna make threats I, I am happy to sit down and negotiate, as John just said. Our job is to find answers. That's what the people elected us to do. They didn't elect us to be rubber stamped. They didn't elect us to check our brain at the door when we walk inside the Capitol. They elected us to put our best ideas forward, have the public discussion. Sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. And that's what I would like to do, is to have that discussion to say, hey, if you have better ideas than we do, we're adults, we can accept that. But I hope you would give us the same courtesy to say, geez, if there are some really good ideas, why wouldn't you take those and let's figure out a way to make them work inside the budget as opposed to saying, if they don't do exactly what we want, we're going off and doing our own thing. I mean, if they want to do that, that would really be unfortunate. I don't see any need. And, and not seeing eye to eye with the Senate right now, do you, are you confident you're still going to have a budget passed by the beginning of July, or do you think this will go throughout the whole summer with these, these conversations? Well, I mean, I, the, the July 1st deadline, luckily for any person who is watching, has no impact on your life. Because unlike Washington, D.C., the previous year's budget just continues. So every dollar that is spent on nursing home care, on uh, aid for any individual, Medicaid, all those things, nothing changes. So the deadline is somewhat artificial to try to force a compromise, which I would love to have it happen by July 1st. That would be a goal. But I'm not, once again, going to check my brain at the door and give up all of the principles that our caucus stands for for an artificial date. If it happens sometime this summer, the average person won't even know any different other than those of us who don't get to enjoy the nice summer weather. <laughs> um, but that's just our job. So if it takes us longer to find the right answer, that's okay. So just to be, just to be clear as well, um, the conversation about the Senate being engaged mm -hmm. in, the, in this, uh, where our position is, uh, Representative Felskowski and I met with a number of the senators uh, last week. Um, we hope to, and a number of them are uh, very supportive and um, like the idea. So we will continue to try and reach out to our Senate colleagues, whether they are on the Joint Finance Committee or not. Um, but that, as uh, you, I think you're all aware of the fact that, that these original conversations were taking place because uh, some of the documents got out to you guys last week. Who are some of those senators who are supporting <laughs> Well, I'm not going to let them come to you. All right, thanks everybody. We have a fiscal bureau memo up here if you'd like to have it. And uh, uh, as what Representative Nygren said, they're available to take additional questions afterwards if you want to run through the memo. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> Um, what you posted last week. Um, yes, but